Good morning. Uh, welcome. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Steve Morrison. I'm the Senior Vice President uh, at the Center for Strategic International Studies here in Washington, which is a, uh, uh, a Washington think tank that focuses pr predominantly on foreign policy and international security. I direct the Global Health Policy Center there, which is in its sixth year. And um, we're really honored and delighted to be able to pull together uh, this, what I think is quite timely discussion here today, and I'll say a few, a few words about the genesis of it in a moment, and then we'll move to our speakers. I'll say a bit about how we're going to organize this discussion. I want to first of all thank two colleagues who've been very instrumental in pulling this together, Catherine Streifel uh, with our program, and uh, Jesse Swanson, who is um, uh, running the camera here today. Uh, we will be videotaping the session here today, and it will be posted on the CSIS site as well as the CUGH site and, and hopefully uh, others like the University of Washington. Anyone else who wishes to post this, please be in touch with me and we'll be happy to, to uh, cooperate with you in making sure that happens. Um, the uh, genesis of this idea, five years ago, we worked with Mike Merson uh, at Duke to do a study which is referenced in the study that you have, the new study that's just come out. We tried to, at that time, delve into what were the factors driving the massive and swift expansion of university and colleges programs in global health. Uh, what were the factors pushing that? And what were the questions that were going to immediately grow out of that in terms of the implications looking forward? And Mike can't be with us today. Uh, today is commencement at Duke. Um, but he was very helpful in thinking this through. And we began to talk at that time along with Keith Martin from CUGH and with King Holmes and his staff, uh, uh, Judd Walson, Alistair Matheson, James Pfeiffer, around um, trying to do a, a, a quick uh, updated study. Uh, the CUGH has now been in existence for, I believe it's eight years. Uh, we've at, we're at a period of uh, almost a full decade of massive expansion of university programs in North America, in Africa, in, in Europe. Um, we wanted to begin to really try and, and, and take some soundings on some of the most fundamental questions around the sustainability. And when we talk about sustainability, we'll hear more from King in a moment around the way that he went about parsing that problem into some component parts around jobs, around money, around rewards and incentive structures and university leadership, and around partnerships uh, outside the boundaries uh, of the university and colleges themselves, and particularly in uh, Africa and Latin America and Asia and other, uh, other countries where much of the work of global health is, is concentrated. Um, we did get this work uh, underway uh, at a late point and that's largely my responsibility. But um, our friends, King and his colleagues at the University of Washington were very obliging and mobilized and scrambled under fairly tight time pressures to pull together this study. It is, um, I think, a very, very important statement of where we are right now uh, and some of the abiding anxieties and uncertainties, ambiguities that are lurking out there in terms of the sustainability. It's a mixed picture. I think there's still a predominant optimism. There's still growth, significant growth. There's still significant excitement. But as this field struggles with some of its own ambiguities and uncertainties, defining what it is, defining what its future is going to look like, um, this kind of discussion is, remain, becomes very, very important. Um, what we're going to do here this morning is um, we're going to ask King Holmes, uh, Chair of Global Health at the University of Washington, to open up. And then we're going to, uh, and he'll speak for eight or nine minutes around synops synopsizing the findings, recommendations, and the ex process of pulling the paper together. Um, we will then turn to uh, Dr. Vanessa Carey for some quick remarks. She's the Associate Director for Partnerships and Global Health Initiatives at Mass General and uh, at the School of Medicine at Harvard and has been the pioneer in pulling together the Global Health Service Partnership, see Global Health as her a wing of that in, in partnership. We'll hear more about that with Peace Corps 
uh, and with the uh, Office of Global AIDS Coordinator. Uh, we'll turn then to Dr. Nelson Suwankambo uh, from Makarere University uh, to hear from his outlook, particularly as one of the principal investigators and partners in the MEPI undertaking, which is now in its fifth year, a very, very important and deep partnership to hear from Nelson. And then we'll turn to Richard Horton, who you all know as the editor in chief at The Lancet, who's offered commentary at various points around this quickly evolving picture, both with respect to North America, but much more broadly in the global outlook. We'll have a couple of rounds of, of, of quick conversation among ourselves, and then at, at, the, at the earliest moment we can find, we'll open the floor to you and ask you to come forward and offer your quick comments uh, and interjections. Please just step to the microphone, identify yourself, try and be very succinct, offer a single intervention, and then we can bundle those together and come back to our panelists. So. Thank you very much. We're going to have to close uh, punctually at 11.30 uh, if, in order to allow the next crowd to come in. So with that, thank you all for being with us. I mean, 12.30, excuse me. <laughs> Pardon me. Thank you for that. King, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for all the work that you, uh, Judd, Alistair, and Jim did to pull this work together. It's really very important. Thank you. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, and uh, it was actually, you'll recall, about uh, just about three months ago exactly, we were both at the Fogarty Center when uh, Steve came over to me and said, King, we're having this panel uh, on uh, sustainability of global health programs. Would you be willing to participate in the panel? I said, sure, I'd be glad to do that. And then uh, we went back to our Fogarty conference and after a couple of hours, we came back out and he said, oh, and, and by the way, uh, uh, we'd also appreciate it if you would do a, uh, uh, nationwide survey on the future of global health. <laughs> I said, whoa. <laughs> but then I said, I'll think about it. And, and I called him back uh, because at our University of Washington, we have uh, a program uh, called the START program. It's run by uh, Judd Walson, who's here, and Lisa Manhart at the UW. And it actually is a, kind of a mini McKinsey uh, consulting group that responds to uh, questions uh, like the one that uh, Steve posed. It's been mainly funded by the Gates Foundation, but they specialize in rapid analysis uh, of uh, projects and, and planning around those projects. Uh, and each uh, project has a student, in this case it's Alistair Matheson, who's here, and a mentor who's Judd Walson, and then uh, content experts in the area that's being looked at. Uh, so far they've done about 60 of these projects and are getting increasing requests from outside of the foundation. So <clears throat> um, it was uh, with that in mind uh, that we formed a team and uh, this was supported by CSIS. And we had a total of four weeks for the design, the implementation, and the analysis of the survey. And we had to get it to CSIS two weeks early so they could produce this very nice uh, brochure for everybody that you all have. So. Uh, uh, with that background, I'll be brief. Uh, uh, Alistair did a uh, Google search of, and found 135 universities and four or five other uh, <coughs> institutions that were uh, doing global health uh, work and in the U.S. and Canada and were uh, uh, potentially eligible for our survey. So they sent out uh, survey requests to these all 135. I think they allowed two weeks to respond, so not surprisingly, uh, the number of respondents was 35, about a quarter of the total. Uh, and at the uh, institutions that responded, the universities responding, um, uh, we, were, we asked for uh, names of students who we could survey as well. And so there were f uh, 53 students who uh, were identified and who responded to the survey. And then 11 global health leaders were interviewed uh, qualitatively, and we had uh, an expert in this area, James Pfeiffer, who helped with the process. So the overall goals uh, in uh, talking about this with Steve Morrison what, were to define the activities that university global health programs were actually focusing on today, what were they expecting to be doing, how would things change uh, by 2019 over the next five years, and uh, to focus on perceived challenges to sustainability. We also asked about opportunities, but we won't be focusing about that here. 
So now in keeping with this uh, 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 shrunk process of time, I have uh, nine minutes to present the results here, and uh, we'll do the best. And I'll just give you the sort of the, the take-home messages. You have your own um, versions of this to look at. Uh, it was great that Steve, you at CSIS, was able to produce this on sh such a short time frame. So I think the first uh, point that struck me was the striking continuing increase after the uh, uh, report that was produced by uh, Mike Merson and uh, his colleague uh, uh, Page, uh, and the number of universities that are engaged in global health. Uh, of the 35 respondents with global health programs uh, in this survey, 17 of them actually nearly one half were started during the last five years. So this increasing is still continuing. Uh, the second point is that there were huge differences in the size and the scope and structure of these global health programs across the universities. Um, <clears throat> and they ranged from relatively small programs, some were at small schools, some even at big schools, uh, that were mainly focusing on educating students at home to promote global citizenship. And they range to very large comprehensive programs with strong global partnerships around the world. So there was a big range. Third was this lack of consensus on what global health is and is not, and that was viewed as one of the challenges in this field. The major activity reported was education monitoring and uh, mentoring, and for 80% uh, of the schools, this was the major program, it took at least 25% uh, of their activity. Research activity and travel for students were also substantial activities. But what surprised uh, us, and particularly me, was that international capacity building and services and partnership, partnerships, and Nelson, your comments on this would be relevant, were much less common and still appear to be minimal for most of the responding institutions. So that was a surprise. Fourth, in terms of sustainability, the biggest perceived threat to sustainability, the one that was mentioned uh, as most important on the list, was uh, the, the fear of reduced funding. However, uh, it was fortunate that the Institute for Health Metrics in Evaluation at the University of Washington had recently come out with a report on trends in funding. Uh, some of you, I hope, have seen it. Uh, but they found that worldwide funding for global health continued to arise through 2013 to uh, $31.3 billion. Uh, so that's quite encouraging. Uh, U.S. government contributions to global health also rose throughout the recession. Uh, in contrast, for example, NIH funding has been steadily declining since 2003, I believe. So a rhetorical question, is there anybody in this room in any area of academia who isn't always worried about future funding? And <laughs> if there is, I don't think I've met that person. <laughs> I think, however, we should realize that this is a new field, and as a new field, global health is certainly less predictable than a field that's been around for 100 years. And competition is increasing because of all these new programs that are coming along. Uh, so I think it is appropriate to be concerned about funding, uh, but uh, uh, not uh, maybe overly concerned. Uh, it was interesting that of the 11 leaders who were interviewed uh, uh, qualitatively, none of them said that they believed that their global health program would not be sustained. And that was uh, clear. The fifth point is that uh, most of the survey respondents viewed global health as a new revenue source for their university, a help to recruit faculty and students, and third, uh, uh, and a way of providing training for global citizenship. Sixth, in terms of what global health is or is not, uh, the big question uh, posed is, uh, and, and many said we still need to define it, one of the challenges that they were experiencing. Is it a discipline offering specific skills to our students that are marketable, or is it a broad field that enables those who have acquired skills in other fields, like medicine, public health, nursing, engineering, law, policy, et cetera, that enables them to apply their skills uh, to a global uh, world. Uh, you know, only 
four percent of the world lives in the North Amer in uh, North America, in the U.S. or Canada, and there's a big world out there. Or uh, is it uh, uh, really uh, both uh, a discipline and a field? Uh, and I think if you read this carefully, you'll you'll see that. Uh, the student survey says they want and need both uh, training in the skills and the applied experience. And this CSIS report that Alistair and Judd uh, primarily prepared does provide specific examples of specific global health skills of the type that we should be increasingly teaching uh, to provide, provide skills beyond uh, global citizenship and enabling them to apply other, other uh, skills. Um, so a big question for us is uh, how well are our academic programs providing both the specific skill sets relevant to global health and giving them the applied experience that they need to apply the skills that, that they learn or that they have. So a seventh point is if our mission is truly to have an impact on global health equity and human rights and global health capacity development, how can the many small emerging academic global health programs contribute to that? And I think this is going to require uh, CUGH help, uh, uh, mentoring, uh, exploring uh, models of the sorts that are being prevented here in the many talks and poster sessions, uh, as well as considerably more support, including university support, to develop the global partnerships that will allow them to uh, be able to do the uh, capacity building. Now you have the full report. <clears throat> Be kind to us because we cranked it out in four weeks, as I said. I want to thank CSIS and Steve Morrison, and particularly Alistair and Judd for the uh, really fine work they did in such a short uh, time. And because you gave me an extra minute, Steve, I'm going to tell you a parable that uh, Judy already knows and likes. And the parable is that uh, once upon a time, there was a very wise old woman and she was healthy and widely respected, so much so that people from villages all around hers came to see her frequently to tell her uh, questions or problems and get her advice. And uh, she had this wonderful reputation. But as many youngsters do, one young boy wanted to show his friends that he could fool her. So he got some friends together and to tarnish her reputation, he caught a little bird and put the bird in his hands, in his palms, and he went to see her with his friends. And he asked her, her, his plan was to ask her whether the bird was dead or alive. And uh, if she said the bird is dead, he would open his hands and the bird would fly away. Uh, or if she said the bird is alive, he would crush the bird and kill it so that when he opened his palms, it would be dead. And this would uh, tarnish her reputation. So uh, he asked her that, wise old woman, is this bird dead or alive in my hands. And she looked at his eyes with wisdom and compassion. And she said, young man, the fate of this bird rests in your hands. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the message I give to all of you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Vanessa? Um, so I have to admit, I'm incredibly humbled to be sharing the stage with um, folks who are essentially my mentors and in many ways actually my professional idols. So I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that I'm very grateful that you're letting me join you in this conversation. Um, and it's interesting because I sit from a, a number of different places. I have the um, wonderful joy of being able to work at the Center for Global Health at Mass General Hospital, where we're looking a lot at how to expand capacity, build partnerships, and really have an impact in global health. But we have an, it's an academic institution as we do this, and we're trying to be innovative and creative how we do this. Um, and so we have projects that, for example, are focusing on disaster preparedness. Um, we also have projects that are looking at a, a we have a consortium of affordable medical technologies, which is um, CAMTEC, which is looking at how to bring together local entrepreneurs and ideas and folks who are the end user of products, bringing together business, bringing together academics to try to problem solve around problems in parts of the world, and then to be able to bring the solutions to scale. So for example, they created a bag mask for infant resuscitation that has a monitor on it that tells you how deep and how quickly you're giving breaths and should you give it faster 
or deeper to actually improve neonatal resuscitation. And then to be able to study the outcomes of that and to be able to bring that to scale and to actually put it in the hands of users. But that's a reverse innovation, for example, that we could also see here in our institutions. So it's been really wonderful to kind of be in that laboratory at the center to begin to think through these ideas. And that laboratory is part of where we came up with the idea for Seed Global Health, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. Um, because Seed Global Health and the Global Health Service Partnership and our partnership with the Peace Corps is very much a program that is focused around education and training um, to build capacity globally, but to be academic and to increase sort of the, uh, the health, the skilled health professional resources that we have globally. Um, but before I come to Seed, I want to sort of respond to just my own sense um, of the report and reading this report and some of the questions that came up for me in reading it and that I think we all need to be asking ourselves as we are academic institutions that are trying to partner and work in the space and train both US health professionals, trainees, um, our own here, whether it's also architect or business or folks in the forestry and environment schools, everything plays into global health. I think that's been one of the tricks of global health, and this was alluded to, is that there's not necessarily a concise definition that we're all in agreement with. And I think the truth is because a lot of things determine global health. There are many determinants of human health. And with globalization, all of that is shifting very much. So what are, I think the biggest question is what are our goals? Are our goals to train our own? Are our goals to have a health impact? Are our goals to train uh, the trainees of our partner sites as well? Are we trying to create a field? Or are we trying to create a discipline? Are we trying to really um, you know, decrease the global burden of disease? But I think we have to be clear, maybe not as a universal consortium of universities, but each institution should at least be clear about what they want from their own institution in terms of that goal. And I think that one of the challenges to that that I would argue is that we need to be very careful to think, to make sure our goals include the partner places where we're working. Because if we go in isolation and we just worry about training our own, we're gonna miss opportunities actually to not only make a meaningful impact in health, but to <coughs> enhance the education of our own trainees, but I think also to make a dent really in the burden of disease and to be able to train our partner sites. Um, and I think that that, idea is important when we talk about sustainability too. Because our sustainability also has to be the sustainability of our partners. We're making a commitment to work with our partners to, to have training sites, to be able to create a program in, um, so one of the things that I'm working on specifically is scaling up ICU care in, in uh, southwestern Uganda. And if we're doing that, we're making a commitment to the head of anesthesiology at Umbrara University of Science and Technology. And we, uh, we need to be able to uphold those promises. So this commitment to education training is a long-term commitment to be involved, I think, an, you know, for a long period of time to see training takes time. It's, it's, it's not the neat and tidy, I vaccinated 200 people today. It's a much messier field. And you gotta get in the weeds and really commit to seeing sort of long-term outcomes. Um, and I think that along those lines for uh, sort of this idea of sustainability and commitment to the partners, I think this is where public-private partnerships can play an incredible role. Um, because it doesn't rely on a single institution or a single entity to uphold the entire partnership, but it relies on everybody to come together to problem solve, much the way we're trying to do this in technology at Mass General. And this is sort of one of the examples that I've taken forth as we try to create Seed Global Health. So the work that we're doing with Seed Global Health, it's a public-private partnership to try to help answer some of these problems. And it's um, a partnership, it's a, Seed Global Health is a private nonprofit who is, that is, uh, is administratively based at the Mass General Hospital that is partnered with the US Peace Corps to send doctors and nurses abroad as health professionals. And these professionals embed as faculty at partner site institutions. We're working in three countries, Tanzania, Malawi, and Uganda, at 11 sites this current year. We're going to 13 next year. We've sent 30 US health professionals to embed as faculty for a minimum of one year. And the idea is that it takes you six months to be able to really understand your partners, to be able to build the relationships that are needed to start to see change. And I think our volunteers would be the first to tell you that they actually now, sort of just crossing the nine month mark, feel like they finally are in a place where they're seeing 
the, the, the benefits of what they're doing. We have one volunteer working in Dar Salaam, forgive me, I know we're not in Kampala at Makarere yet, but hopefully we will be, who's a cardiologist, and he and his counterpart noticed the patterns of admission of heart failure patients coming into the, into the unit. And the Moon Billy Hospital is the largest referral hospital in Tanzania, and they noticed that the, over 70% of the admissions were coming in with a certain diagnosis in a certain way, but they were getting clustered all around the hospital, or not clustered for that matter, and that they realized that if they, just a simple change of how they admitted these patients, where they admitted them, and the protocols they admitted them under, they could actually elevate the level of care of all of these patients. More importantly, they could also train differently for the trainees around this. And so they're helping to transform education and care around cardiology. This same volunteer has actually produced a number of publications this year with the first author being his local counterpart or one of his students. So that he's building the academic rigor as well of the institution. And so they'll be publishing on critical care, cardiovascular critical care and global heart, the World Heart Federation's uh, journal later this year. So it's been a really incredible thing to see them do. See global, so they go as Peace Corps volunteers for this one year. We're leveraging on the US commitment to global health. But Seed Global Health provides uh, in technical capacity around education and around medical and nursing care. We also provide debt repayment stipends so that these health professionals can afford to go. 27 of our 30 volunteers actually required debt repayment this year. So it's been a huge commitment that we've offset close to $700,000 worth of debt through our part of the commitment. We work with academic institutions like the Mass General Hospital Center for Global Health in order to leverage um, both the models that we've learned from Mass General's longstanding partnership with Umbrara University, or to use electronic resources, or to build the monitoring and evaluation in an academically rigorous way. We are a partner with industry. We just partnered with the GE Foundation to put handheld bed ultrasounds in the hands of our volunteers and their counterparts so that you're no longer just guessing what's happening with the stethoscope, but you're actually able to see inside the body in real time. And we're trying to leverage all of this to help enhance education and capacity building so that we're gonna help build a new generation of Ugandan, Tanzanian, and Malawian doctors and nurses who will be highly skilled and able to continue training for years to come. And I think that this kind of public-private partnership that draws on the strengths of many partners to problem solve is an important way to help answer some of the sustainability. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Uh, Nelson. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me preface my remarks with uh, two comments. One is this session is entitled, Can U.S. Universities Sustain Their Global Health Commitments? And I asked myself, why do I have to sit here <laughs> with this kind of thing? Uh, but let's see how it goes. <coughs> Secondly, uh, you see Richard on the other end, and Nelson here. Yeah. This is no longer a debate. Forget what happened in the morning. <coughs> Take us a little more serious here. Uh, I was asked to comment on the MEPI program. That is the Medical Education Partnership Initiative, which is uh, funded by the US government, uh, covering 12 countries in Africa, 13 grants that were awarded. And my institution, McKinley University, is uh, one of those that is benefiting. So in the context of uh, uh, the focus of this uh, panel discussion, uh, if I have to give one message regarding sustainability of uh, uh, you, you know, the programs where these universities are involved, the northern universities, I would say one thing. That is, as you engage in these programs, if you think only about your interests, about the interests of northern institutions, these cannot be sustained, period. These programs, as you engage in them, they should also have an interest in what is happening in those countries, and as Vanessa said, building capacity for those institutions and countries then it is a win-win situation and these can be sustained, assuming everything else remains equal, that is funding and so on. But even if funding doesn't remain constant or is not uh, increasing all the time, as uh, King Holmes uh, stated, 
when you are working together in a very meaningful way, considering each, uh, each other's interest, you raise the funds together. In Uganda, we have programs that have uh, lasted for 20 years plus. And I see Tom Quinn in the audience. We have had an ongoing collaboration with the John Hopkins University, and things which we can consider global health. And for 20 years, we've been able to get funding from different sources in order to continue. <coughs> Specifically, specifically, if I comment on uh, the MEPI programs, MEPI is one of those uh, uh, initiatives that I can tell you, as I said, I'm no longer in a debate, this is not a debate. This is one of the best things that has happened in the last 50 years. It's one of the best things that has happened in our country. Up I was a dean for 12 years, and since then, uh, I'm heading a college of health sciences for another five years. The development of MEPI has been one of the most exciting period in my, during that time. There is clearly a true partnership between the institutions, and our institutions yeah, yeah, in the developing world, and those in the northern hemisphere. Of course, things vary a little bit depending on which country one is working in, but generally there is real partnership, uh, which has uh, been able to create a sense of ownership among the institution <coughs> so that they determine what they would like to do and taking health professionals' education to a new level thinking seriously about how to develop human resource capacity that is beneficial to uh, the country. In other words, these programs have really demonstrated value add to our institutions, to our environment. And therefore, if you've got a program which doesn't demonstrate value addition to what is happening, again, it cannot be sustained value addition is a, and that's an issue that one has to keep constantly asking if we are undertaking these global health programs what value are you adding to the local environment of course sustainability is an issue how can these programs be sustained uh, what has been happening in mepi is uh, new things have happened and in general, they are integrated into the institutional infrastructure and mechanism. Because they are integrated within the institutional infrastructure, even if MEPI stopped, of course a few things may fall you know, by the wayside, but there are many <coughs> things which will be retained. For example, new programs have been started, uh, curriculum reviews, have now become the thing of you know what the institutions do, and yet many institutions previously you know would run a curriculum for ten years it hasn't been revised, but now people are really attuned to uh, doing that. New modalities or new approaches to health professional education, including e-learning uh, and so forth, are things that these institutions are thinking about. The creation of a South-to-South -South collaboration is extremely prominent. Never before in my institution, and I've been with my institution for 30 years plus, as you can guess, um, never had we had the kind of collaboration South-to-South -South that we are having. Within the country, medical schools collaborating, and also between countries across Africa. But now it is a regular, a regular approach to what we're doing. So that the global health program, and maybe I call it as a global health program, has been a catalyst in not only strengthening our north-south partnerships, but has also uh, catalyzed and strengthened the south-south partnerships. Let me demonstrate a little on that, and I'll keep quiet. 
in Uganda itself. I mean, when the call was put out by MEPI that, you know, we could, institutions could apply for this funding, Makere University could have gone along and applied for the funding. But we decided right from the beginning, it's not the North that told us to do so. We decided ourselves from the institution that look, it probably will get much better results or returns on investment if the institutions in the country, the medical schools in the country, got together and worked together in order to advance health professions education in the country. And that's what we did right from the beginning. <coughs> Never before have I seen the kind of collaboration and partnership that we are having across the country. And because of that collaboration, that is a sustain sustainable initiative because we can now influence government and policies much more easily. Thank you. Thank you, Nelson. <laughs> uh, Richard Florsher. Thank you very much, and it's nice not to have to shout. Um, <laughs> let me, let me um, try and answer the question very directly, because it is very specifically about can US universities sustain their global health commitments. I'm fundamentally extremely optimistic and think the answer to that is yes. Just a few weeks ago, I had the privilege of being at uh, the launch of a new uh, UCL Center for World Health, um, which is an inspiring initiative led by Tom Coates, who many of you will know well. And Tom, having spent a large part of his working life um, in the mainstream of the AIDS movement, has brought many of those values and experiences, uh, experiences of the AIDS movement to bear on the thinking of his new Center for World Health. But let me try and um, simplify um, this, what is a very complex question, as you've heard from King and, and others, um, into a very simple dichotomy. And it's a dichotomy of supply and demand. And let me just start with demand. Um, as King's report says, global health didn't just emerge from nowhere. And the report that uh, he and his colleagues have written identify three particular drivers. One is to do with the demand from students. The second is global health as a foreign policy issue. And the third is just money. There was money for it. Let me just try and sharpen that a little bit more, because I think that there are two drivers that are not fully cited in the report that I would lay great emphasis on. The first is that many powerful countries saw global health as a security issue. Um, particularly if we think of, about the threat of AIDS, that was very much framed very successfully as a security threat to nations. And now, as we think about the risk of pandemics, that too is a security threat in the country. I come from the United Kingdom. There's a government committee called COBRA, and, one of it, and it's a security committee. And the chief medical officer sits on that committee why? Because one of the main threats is to do with pandemics and now antibiotic resistance. So it's not just foreign policy, it's very specifically security. The second big driver, I think, was global health as an economic issue. Uh, globalization was a great opportunity seen by countries, powerful countries, to create market states. Go back to Philip Bobbitt's book about the birth of the market state. And if if you reread the Commission on Macroeconomics and Health, at the center of that commission, it was about addressing poverty, addressing disease, with the clear goal of economic growth to create market states to meet the needs of globalization. So to me, the demand for global health depends at least partly on the continuation of those drivers, security and economics. And I think when you look at those two drivers, they are even more important today than they were 10 or 20 years ago. So on those grounds, definitely, it's a global health in universities in the US is sustainable. I would add two additional drivers that, that make it even more sustainable. Uh, one was mentioned by Nelson this morning uh, in, our, in our little exchange, um, and that was country demand. Uh, if you look at universal health coverage and why that's so popular, it's to do with incredible demand from countries, the drive for universal health coverage. If I look at an area that I work particularly in, every woman, every child, 
women's and children's health, thanks to every woman and every child, the demand by countries for uh, efforts to scale up delivery of care for women and children, absolutely massive. The second new driver, I think, is unquestionably uh, climate change. And I think that's going to, uh, thanks to uh, the IPCC process and the post-Kyoto process that will culminate in December in 2015 in Paris, we're going to see that as a huge driver too. So I'm very optimistic about demand. What about supply? So it's all the usual things of leadership and education and research and service and the ability to meet those four demands that I've just mentioned. But I would say that there's a conditionality about, about uh, supply meeting those, demand, that those demands. And it is that we have to change the way we do our education and our research. More of the same is not going to be enough. And I don't think many of our leaders of, of institutions that um, are at the forefront of global health have yet grasped the need to change the models of education and research. Let me give one example for research. And I appreciate that leaders of institutions are often trapped with, with a perverse set of incentives, but still those have to be pushed back. Science needs to change, I think, from a closed system to an open system. So let me try and explain what I mean by open science. The system of science we have at the moment has not really changed for 300 years, and it's those old Mertonian norms of science. Be first, be famous, monopolize the field, keep secrets, and don't tell your competitors what you're doing, and don't help them very much. That's got to change, and yet I see every institution I go to, I still see that competitive instinct. Um, and it's not helped by us at journals. The whole system we've got drives those Mertonian norms ever deeper into our culture, and they have to be challenged. Universities have to change so that they are drawing in others Particularly, I would say, from civil society, everybody talks about the private sector, but please let's also talk about citizen science, talk about crowdsourcing, how we bring in uh, an open, participatory, transparent culture within our universities for the way we do science, addressing societal challenges much more directly, producing outputs that matter, and again, not just papers in journals, outputs that really matter, and then thinking about how you change the reward system so that you incentivize people to address those issues and outputs that matter. And then finally, not just speaking to, from scientist to scientist, but really working harder to speak <coughs> from scientist to policy maker. I think there's an additional really important and valuable role that the university, and perhaps only, perhaps only the university can do. And that's this idea of independent accountability. We don't have any institution today that is truly successful at doing independent accountability. I'm part of one very, very tiny, tiny effort. Uh, it's called the Independent Expert Review Group on Information and Accountability for Women's and Children's Health. It's a ridiculously long title for a very small little, little, little sort of pimple on the backside of global health. But what we're trying to do and now I just remember this is being filmed. Um, that what, we're, what, we're trying to, what we're trying to do um, is to bring this idea of science as a tool for making sure that people who've made promises and made commitments truly deliver on those promises and commitments. And it's a very simple idea. And this is what I think Departments of Global Health is perfectly set up to do, to measure. You can measure progress. Second... You can then, and this is why this open participatory, open science is so important, you can then bring people together, insert the evidence, the data that you've collected into a political process that is participatory and transparent and democratic so that those data hold people accountable for what they've done and then make sure that those with power act on those data. It's a very simple three-step model of monitoring, review and action. But it's what I think the global health community and universities can play a much more powerful part in. So to me, global health isn't something that's static. It's got to change and evolve as demands change and evolve. And the future and sustainability is going to depend upon those demands around security, economics, what countries want and the demand that's coming from countries, both civil society and governments, and the threat um, of climate change. And it's going to depend, I think, on 
this different way of doing education, different way of doing science, and grasping the opportunity of being a tool, an instrument for independent accountability. Well, thank you all very much. Um, I'm going to offer one quick comment and then uh, a question to come back to, uh, to the speakers. Um, the picture that's drawn, I think, is very mixed. Um, over, leans heavily in the optimistic side. Um, we've heard in the study and in the comments continued high growth. We've, concern, we've heard that MEPI is a maturing and almost transformative type of partnership. We've heard that things like SEED uh, and the Global Health Service Partnership are, is able to begin and operate. So we've seen these two very powerful examples. I think it's important to reemphasize that on campuses among students and faculty, an altruistic and globalist outlook is still very strong. And I think that is underpinning much of this. We've heard that US budgets are resilient, even in a face of scarcity and austerity, um, and that the core focus on training, education, and mentoring continues to draw student and faculty uh, uh, interest and support. And from Richard, we've heard that the drivers, the security and economic drivers remain strong. They're transmuting into new forms, but they remain very strong. Universal health coverage, climate change are getting added into that. I think the, the more negative side of the, of the uh, balance sheet is the question of whether we're at a bubble, in a bubble point in terms of the expansion of the U.S. programs. Um, and when you look at the, at the study that uh, Judd and Alistair and Michael King put together, it does beg the question of whether this is an overbuilt set of commitments. Um, there are still some, some nagging problems that at a decade in seem somewhat unusual that the field has not been defined, the metrics for progress are not there, the data on employment are not there. Leadership, there's plenty of evidence that leadership at the high level of universities may be cooling in some important places. This was in a way a speculative enterprise in the ex very rapid, very dramatic expansion of programs. Speculative in the sense that it was responsive to demand and it was hopeful that the resources would come forward. But as we've seen, the actual consolidation of deep partnerships is missing in the external side. Uh, Nelson's made the very impassioned <coughs> point that this is a fundamental criteria for judging success. And yet that dimension is absent in, in many, if not most, of the programs. So, and we've heard that the competition for resources on a fixed or declining resource base means that, I mean, that seems to imply that there will be some kind of shakeout in the, in the in expected in the, in the period looking forward. So a very mixed kind of picture um, and a complicated one and perhaps not too surprising because this is a new field. It's a dynamic field. It's a, it remains a quick, quickly evolving picture. Uh, and American society is, an, is, a, is a highly, in this, in this instance, it's shown itself to be highly adaptive and responsive and sensitive to these, to these sorts of shifts, which is quite, quite typical, I think. So the question back to our speakers. If you're going to deliver a message, a top line message to the university leadership of United States colleges and universities around thinking about global health in the next five to 10 years, what is that message? And if you're going to speak to the leadership of the Consortium of Universities of Global Health, you're going to speak to the board of CUGH and say, you need to get focused upon the sustainability issues. What is the advice to them on what they should do in the next two years to get a better handle on this situation? So it's two questions. One is, you're speaking to the leadership of American universities, the presidents of these institutions. What advice do you give to them on the next five to 10 years? And then you're speaking to the board of CUGH about getting a better handle on this very complicated and important set of issues. King, would you like to help kick this off? I know I give you short notice on every request I come to you with, so. Uh, we reviewed a, 
Some of us who are in the room participated in a review of another very strong program recently and uh, in which the leaders of the university uh, had uh, put together a very strong commitment towards global health, uh, but both were due to depart uh, shortly. And we were, uh, uh, there was not any obvious evidence that things were going to get worse, but uh, what we advised was that uh, there be every effort to structurally institutionalize the commitments that had been made by the people who were initially uh, enthusiastic uh, to create the programs. Uh, the advancement efforts, uh, the, that is the fundraising and development uh, efforts that had been initially planned uh, were uh, it turned out much more ambitious than what was realistic. And uh, the uh, uh, creation of a, a stable infrastructure could be, for example, and, and I'll be more general than that mm -hmm. institution, uh, thinking about the the entity that is called global health. If it's an office in a dean's office or an office in a president's office uh, or something at the divisional level, it's very parochial and very limited and uh, there just isn't the, the uh, mandate to proceed. Uh, so creating a department or an institute uh, really uh, with the funding that's required to keep it going <coughs> makes it an institutionalized program. It has to develop uh, according to the uh, goals and, and uh, strength of the university <coughs> as well as the evolving field. But uh, that's maybe my first contribution, mm -hmm. taking programs that are basically fairly fragile and making commitments while the people who started up the programs in the first place are still around uh, or if it hasn't been done, <coughs> even if things have changed. Uh, Look for something that's stable and working. And King, while you're while you're speaking, uh, could uh, you've done this this research, uh, undertaken this research? What would be your advice to the CUGH board in terms of the next phase? The way to the way to to begin delving more deeply into understanding these issues. Well, one thing that occurred to me in doing this four-week uh, uh, effort is that it provides the kinds of. Uh, uh, interesting information that suggests to me that we need to go on to a larger scale effort to define what actually is going on uh, in North America and Canada and focus in more detail on the, the things that we think are were, were least well examined, the strengths of partnerships and so on. I think uh, that at the CUGH board meeting uh, yesterday there are <coughs> several now very active committees. Uh, um, and one of the thoughts that came out of uh, what we're doing yesterday is to take the University Enabling Systems Committee, which I'm on, uh, and uh, it's given workshops around the country to sort of teach administrators and, and leaders how to uh, uh, get around some of the hurdles to mm -hmm. operate, uh, to go live on a webinar and make this a more uh, out, more, uh, a broad, broad spectrum outreach to l allow people to share what's working and what's not working. Uh, the, the education committee has formed five, I think, subcommittees, four or five subcommittees to focus on what are the core competencies we need to be teaching. I think that's a particularly important one. I, I think that many of these programs are uh, trying to inspire the uh, <coughs> students by talking about global health equity and justice. These, these are important issues, but the skills that are needed are not yet uh, being offered. And they relate to things like health, health economics, uh, uh, cross uh, country big data analyses like the Institutes for Health Metrics are doing and so on. So that we really are giving people the skills and, and when they have some skills like epidemiology or biostatistics or policy, making them start applying those to the global health field. So those are a few yes. things. Vanessa, as a, as a leader at an American, as a global health leader at an American university, well, how do you see these two issues of messaging to the leadership of the universities in America, in America and also advice to the CUGH leadership? Th 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 these are huge questions. <laughs> it, it's interesting. I mean, just thinking about the sustainability issue, and I think when we leverage the global health and we're trying to get leaders 
of institutions to back it. I think that ultimately these leaders are accountable to their constituency. And so if you're gonna really want them to continue the support, I think you have to also explain why this matters here at home. And it, it shouldn't that shouldn't be the sole argument because again, our partners and their priorities and the places we're working need to be very much at the top of the programs we're building. But to build support and to build your the support you need here at home, you wanna make the argument of why it matters for us. It's much the way you're saying that economics and foreign policy and security is what we're leveraging with our government often to keep funding behind this issue. That's the it's kind of the, the, the focal point. And I think to that effect, what needs to be really understood is a very fundamental change in our society that has happened, which is that you know we talk about globalization and we say that globalization is happening. But if you really think about it, technology has changed to in a way that is not going to reverse. We are able to see images now very quickly. You have people sending um, the disaster, you know, when, you, when we have a disaster, there are images coming out of Haiti or information coming out of Haiti about where people are buried under the rubble that we don't control. There's a whole, there's a whole population out there that is feeding us with information, feeding us with images, and therefore we are confronted by the disparities of the world in a way that we never were really forced to confront before. And that is a point that has just happened. And as a result, I think that we are that we are always going to be confronted with the fact that there are huge inequities in the world in a very raw way. And that is always going to be a moral imperative and an academic imperative and a and a real fire behind people who are coming through training or faculty who are currently working that are going to keep driving this. How you continue to provide structured and I think you harness that that energy and interest is very important but I think that because we've passed that point um, it's important that we find a way to really make a you know st structure around it and to that effect I think that there's opportunities for these institutions to be able to actually bring things home from that though there is the opportunity to engage in learning that comes back to the United States to engage in research that is in partnership that benefits both the partner site but also our home institutions. The um, we're you know the ability to re reverse innovate again. I mean another example is using bedside ultrasound. I know that um, so a colleague of ours at Mount Sinai has been doing this with medical students here in the United States. But if we can really show how effective bedside ultrasound is to provide enhanced education then maybe that's something that we introduce in our schools here as well. Um, but that is a cost-effective, inexpensive technology that can really enhance patient diagnosis and management. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think that, um, so it's really important, I think, for these institutions to realize that there is improved education, improved training, and, in, and really an ability to leverage a contribution to, you know, globally that enhances our own universities here. You know, to the CUGH board, um, I think that th their role can really be to help leverage that argument as well, but also to leverage it not just to institutional leadership, but to leverage it to the government, to leverage it to funders, to leverage it to really realize that um, there need that you know it's going to take many parties together to be able to enhance this, uh, you know, to enhance education. But you know, the one message I just want to say to the leadership just a little bit separate to leveraging global health leadership, but as somebody who is young in their career and wants to see this be academically, you know, sort of recognized, it's a really big deal what you're saying about scientific openness because the pressure to publish and the pressure to be first author and the pressure to produce is, means that you're not going to spend the time programmatically. So I'll just give the example. This idea of seed global health came out in the New England Journal of Medicine originally. And everybody congratulated me on publishing the New England Journal of Medicine. And I got to be honest with you, I was like, what are you congratulating me for? Yeah. It's just an idea. It doesn't actually exist. You can congratulate me when this actually exists and it's flourishing and it's sustainable and we're doing something. And I think, but now I've consumed the last two years of my life, not in a bad way, I'm thrilled with it, trying to put this program together. But I've not necessarily published. My boss is in the room, listen, please. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, no, to be fair, David has been an incredible supporter of mine when I've taken this very unconventional career path. But I think we are going to have to think creatively about how we do this. And I want to make sure. <laughs> but I also want to make sure as I'm doing this and I'm publishing, Pili Chilo, the cardiologist in Tanzania, is the first author on a paper. But that might bury me somewhere in the middle. It's worth it, but it might not. So I think these are just all part of the things that we need to do collectively. Thank you. Nelson, could you offer some thoughts on what advice from where you sit would you offer to the leadership of American universities, colleges, and to CUGH? What would you say? I love what Vanessa has just said. I see these people from the North competing to be the first, either the first or the senior author. And I wish they could behave differently. But to the university administration. I think university presidents, as much as they are interested to develop these programs for their students and faculty, they should take an equally keen interest in asking the questions. How are those institutions we are partnering with internationally benefiting? At the end of the day, it should be equitable partnerships, where it's a win-win situation. Otherwise, it ends up with the international institutions as, in quotes, playground for the institutions from here. Constantly asking the question, as a university president, how are those institutions benefiting? If that is done, I think we'll go a long way in ensuring that the global health initiatives are making a difference to those places. In addition, the university presidents should provide a kind of environment that is supportive to people who want to engage in global health meaningfully environment supportive to the kind of approach she's taken. I'm not dying for being a fast author, and yet I'm doing all these things. How does that person exist and be on the road to promotion uh, despite not having the kind of publications that are required? To the CUGH board, I would say CUGH is a very good uh, initiative. But for universities to buy into CUGH, they must see value. What is it that they're gaining from CUGH? What are they losing, not being part of CUGH? So again, <coughs> making sure that there's something to benefit and benefit in very meaningful ways, the board needs to keep attention I would pay attention to that. In addition, the board needs to find ways of how to support similar initiatives that might be emerging internationally. Because CUHH has existed longer than any of the newer ones, and some are not yet even born. Uh, but how can you provide the kind of support to those? And lastly, related to CUJ board is, as we've heard, people use the term global health to mean different things. And where I see it, people ask the question all the time, what is this global health thing that these people are dying for? <laughs> because every day that's what we live and do. Why are they now calling it something different? So if we can collectively come together and agree on a terminology or a definition that has currency not only here, but also internationally. I think then we'll make significant progress. Thank you, Nelson. I'm going to turn to Richard. Though, when Richard's done, <laughs> when Richard's com complete, please come 
uh, to these microphones and we'll turn to the audience and we'll bundle together uh, three or four quick comments uh, uh, and, and questions and then come back. So if you could gather by those. Richard, yeah. please. Okay, very quickly. Um, message to university leadership. Uh, global health is not a revenue opportunity. It's an opportunity to return your institution to a moral vision about education, research, and service. Second, on the CUGH board. Now, there is a real um, danger here. And the first message to the board is don't be complacent. Uh, we've been a partner of something called the World Health Summit for the past four or five years. Fantastic idea, started in 2009, um, to try and mobilize the European voice in uh, global health. Full of enthusiasm for the first couple of years, and honestly now, staggering, a bit weary, not quite sure of its purpose, um, losing direction, uh, generally getting a little fed up. So thinking about exactly what your purpose is, what the added value is, absolutely right. The great comparative advantage I see in CUGH, actually, is this vibrant young researcher community uh, that you've got coming here and presenting and discussing. And this is a different community than usually goes, goes to global health meetings. And it's your great, great secret of success. Don't lose it and think about how to develop it. How can you take all the young people who are here from different institutions and different parts of the world and take that talent and mobilize it in some way, whether it's in further education and training, leadership, policy development, I don't know, but there's an opportunity there which, you, which is so, so special. Of course, thirdly, I completely agree about deep partnerships, which Nelson has talked about, to which I would only add um, partnerships should extend into this arena of open science and between different health professional and scientific professional groups. I want to add in a fourth area of accountability. I've already spoken about that. But the last point, I think, for the CUGH board is this. We've got hundreds, literally hundreds, of pieces of research presented at this meeting. And then every year for the past five years, you've been doing this. The great problem we have is that there's no meaning brought to those individual units of, of research that are reported. What CUGH could do is to bring meaning interpretation to this vast amount of data that the community is producing. What do we do with it? What does it tell us? What clues does it give us and policymakers and governments and others about what they should do? There are clues buried within that, but don't let it just be an abstract presented at this meeting or in an abstract book or a poster on the wall. Think about how you can use that to some good so it has a life beyond these few days in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much. Please quickly identify yourself. We'll start with the person here, right here. Right here. And okay. then we'll go uh, Roger, and then there's a microphone in the back, and then we'll, we'll take four quick, so please. Kat Miser, coming from Berkeley, and I just have a quick question, probably mostly addressed toward you, Nelson, and based on conversations I've had with Jess Everett of Child Family Health International. Um, do you feel like there's adequate consultation with the Global South about competencies and what would be um, uh, proper core competencies, and here I'm thinking of things you've mentioned today, like value addition, and then you know big pharmaceutical companies doing research in developing countries, and that no benefits accrue to the local population. So I would hear benefit addition, things like that. Do you feel there's adequate consultation, and if so, how could we achieve it better from okay. your perspective? Hold for a second. Roger. Yeah. Roger Glass from Fogarty. This was a wonderful session. And I want to make two, two comments on the, on the constitution of CUGH's recommendations. One is that this is a university, consortium of universities. One of the concepts there was we would get in uh, legal departments to deal with uh, tax around sugar or salt or, or uh, tobacco, as it's been, delivery in business schools, behavioral science, uh, political scientists to deal with the policies, and economists who, to deal with ministers of finance, which would be critical. So I'd love to see some discussion from the panel on the engagement of the other parts of the university to make this uh, a whole. 
And the second is that five years ago when this started, I don't think we had any foreign universities present. And I can only say that from this meeting, the contribution of foreign universities uh, has really enriched this dialogue enormously, especially in this morning's debate. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Oh. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I can't see it very well. So let's go to you right here and then back uh, to the gentleman in the, on the rear microphone. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, Olga Waldman from UMass. Um, I'm just curious, we talked a lot about how partnerships and education initiatives are the really important and key initiatives in global health setting, and yet most of the funding um, supports research activities and a project, which are all short term. Um, and there's really, it's really hard to find opportunity for financial support of educational um, initiatives. And I was curious to hear your thoughts on that. Thanks. Thank you. In the rear. Hi, uh, David Zakis from the University of Alberta in Edmonton. Uh, thank you very much. It was a really brilliant discussion and presentations. My question is for Richard, and I thank you very much for introducing the concept of climate change into all of this and for your contribution of the word even planetary health in an editorial some time ago, I've taken that to great heart. I just wonder though how you reconcile your justification for economic development with the planetary health, fully knowing that further economic development only leads to increased fossil fuel consumption and, and further destruction of the planet. Thank you. <laughs> Boom. Uh, let's take one more. Ma'am, right here. Yes. Me? Please. I'm Marjorie Mack. I'm Assistant Dean for Global Health at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. And therefore, my interest is very much in interdisciplinary coordination and collaboration. I've not heard that mentioned on the panel. And for instance, my a comment is that it would be very nice in a panel such as this, as much as I esteem and value each of the pe uh, people on the panel, they're all physicians. And I would very much like to see a nurse, a veterinarian, a, a dentist, or somebody in oral health, you know, in the different con uh, fields of global health, in addition to, to business and economics, as, as Roger was just saying, and these others. Um, I think that as um, speaking for nursing, um, which in general has been very, my, my message to the CGUH Pro Board, <coughs> which is I know there are two nurses on, on the board, and, um, and they have very strong, effective voices. But I would like to see um, more of nursing's perspective represented in the programs. For example, um, in nursing, there's a lot of bench research, basic research, but there's also a strong focus on primary health care. And that nurses outnumber any other health uh, profession in, around the world. And they need, they have, they have special challenges and uh, needs. And so in nursing, we often implement the values and philosophy that Nelson has so well expressed this morning um, in different ways from medicine and the other fields. And that's my comment. Thank you. Um, we'll come back for a second round. We've got about 15 minutes left. I'm in a reverse order here and ask Richard, Nelson, Vanessa uh, King to offer some responses to the various questions put forward. Richard. Okay, I'm gonna be very quick and just pick up two points. First of all, David, thank you for your challenge to me, um, and I wasn't clear. I was specifying reasons not supporting them uh, or endorsing them. I think that those security and economic reasons are, are really important drives. They're not the drives that I want to see as being important. That's why I added in those other two of um, country demand and planetary threats. Um, so I completely agree with you on that, and sorry for not being clearer. Um, secondly, on the, and this was Olga asking a question about long-term funding. Again, completely agree with you about that. Um, I think the answer is invite the funders to, the people who control the money to your meeting and get them engaged in a dialogue. That's really, really, really important um, because then you can begin to, in a sense, hold them accountable for those decisions. But don't be afraid to bring them. And it is, I mean, when Gates gave 100 million to IHME over 10 years, that gave the freedom 
for IHME to pursue issues that it would have been impossible for them to pursue over two to three year project grants. So it is transformative to have that long term funding. I agree. So bring them to your meeting. Thank you. Nelson? Yes, briefly, the first question was whether there has been adequate consultation. And the short answer is no. We need to do more in having those consultations and getting the ideas uh, from the developing world. The second question was about silos and interdisciplinary approach uh, to global health. Yes, that's what global health is uh, uh, supposed to do, bring in various disciplines uh, from across uh, the university to participate in this. We know that uh, some of the institutions uh, here in the, in the US and Canada are doing uh, a very good job in that direction. We are not doing so well in our part of the world and we struggle with issues of institutional structures and how support this kind of approach. But it isn't, uh, it is not that we don't value it, it's a question of how do we go around the institutional structures. Uh, the lack of funding for education initiatives, that is absolutely true. We struggle a lot to get funding for educational initiatives it's relatively much easier for research. And yes, the funders need to change their approach to, to this. Thank you. Vanessa? Um, so just quickly on a, on a few of these points, I think just to speak to the nursing, and Monday is actually International Nursing Day. Um, so, and I think it's an important to recognize that because majority healthcare often is provided by non-physicians. And at C Global Health and also the National Center for Global Health, we actually have a whole nursing initiative that is going on and half of our volunteers are nurses. And I think that to that effect, we do need to recognize the spectrum of healthcare and task shifting and the, and the way that we're gonna solve these problems, again, is by a consortium of individuals with different skill sets and, and different leadership to be able to address some of these problems. And we sent doctors and nurses at C intentionally together with the idea of interprofessional modeling and to try to change the paradigm of that relationship. So I think it's a really important thing to pay attention to. Um, to Dr. Glass's point, I think that the spectrum of people involved in global health is incredibly important. And actually, one of the visions of SEED would be that we would send lawyers, partner with the law school, send lawyers to deal with those kinds of regulatory issues or to help stand up, uh, you know, trade agreements in a better way that aren't exploitative and to be able to create that kind of capacity. And equally, you could do architects, you could do engineers. Um, I think it's very important to think about the, the spectrum of, of professions that contribute to global health. An architect who can build a hospital with great ventilation can reduce TB transmission enormously. So it, it's a very powerful thing. Um, Long-term funding is a huge issue and I really want to second that idea of challenging back and really in being able to create or to paint the vision of what needs to happen and what leverages that uh, sort of contribution and that long-term funding and the ability to dig in for the long-term is gonna be critically important to solving these solutions. And I think that, um, you know, when we talk about human resources for health, for example, that is, it takes five, my husband trained for seven years. You know, that is just seven years of residency that doesn't even include his, four years of medical school or everything that goes before it. So we need to, you know, when I, I work in Human Resources for Health primarily, we need to be making a long-term commitment. And that is where we're gonna sort of ultimately see changes. And I, I think just to sort of wrap back to the original question of, of leveraging again, is that every country, including our own, including Canada, including Uganda, is going to have health inequities. And so being able to solve problems in global health is very much a problem here for home. And being able to argue that to your institutions, to your funders, that we are trying to solve the big problems, not the easy fixes. But so challenging people to rise to that vision, I think is incredibly important. People, we like challenges. We like to work hard. We like to see, to strive for a big goal and a big vision. And I think we all have to be part of creating uh, that challenge and 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 a little bit that optimism that we can solve these problems if we dig in. So it's a combination. Thank you, King. And we'll come back to uh, for just a couple of last interventions and then we'll wrap up. Thank both you. Uh, both Roger and uh, Marge uh, Marjorie Mecca uh, spoke about the importance of interdisciplinarity. Some people use the term multidisciplinary, uh, but uh, the uh, couple of thoughts on how to go after that structurally and uh, through leadership. 
uh, when we were formed as a department, we were formed as a department in two schools, School of Medicine and School of Public Health. So I get to report to two deans every day, which is great. And uh, the, uh, but the president of the university, Mark Emmert, said, uh, you are not in your department going to just be a department for the School of Public Health and its five departments or the School of Medicine and its 30 departments. We expect you to be uh, involving all of the departments and all 16 schools at the university in global health. So currently we have uh, uh, about 300 faculty and of those about 250 are uh, adjunct appointments or joint appointments from other departments and schools and uh, they are very interested in global health and quite participatory in our educational programs, training programs, and so on. So that's one approach, is to promote this through adjunct and uh, uh, joint and affiliate appointments and so on. Um, I think uh, in terms of how you maximize interdisciplinarity uh, at a university, uh, forming in, an institute or a department are optimal ways of doing it. An institute isn't in a department typically, it's uh, across university, across school. Uh, and is able to bring in uh, people from about throughout the school, and that's the way Duke does it. The disadvantage of an institute <coughs> in general is they can't hire faculty. A department is able to hire faculty from, uh, you know, all of the disciplines at the university. So these are a couple of structural factors to think about. <coughs> Thank you. Let's take, we only have about five minutes remaining, and I promised Glendora that we would close on time. So, ma'am. Uh, yes, I, Richard brought up the point of how do you change the um, incentivization, and I think uh, Vanessa also brought that up, saying that you know it isn't publishing being a first author in high index journals. King Holmes, I said in the last sentence of his bio, I have mentored more than a hundred people. Peter Piot and Tom Quinn are two of the people he mentored. So just with those two, you've exponentially increased King's impact on global health. <laughs> and one of the things that is not funded, and I know this because I've self-funded um, doing this, is mentoring. Mentoring in a way that is not to publish a paper or to get a grant or to do anything. So I would like to know how we can <coughs> encourage universities and funders to fund mentors. Can you just quickly identify And yourself, my name is Anne-Marie Nelson and I'm from the Joint Pathology Center. Thank you. Which is a very highly unfunded specialty. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Judy. Judy Wasserheit, University of Washington. Steve, congratulations on a great session and thank you to all of you. You know, there, there's a guy named Kuhn who wrote a book about the nature of scientific revolutions. And I think one of, and it's a fantastic book, I think one of the exciting things about global health right now is that because of globalization, we have an opportunity uh, to move to a real scientific revolution and uh, also link that to training. And several of you have kind of touched on uh, a piece of that as you've talked about the need for radical changes in the architecture of the way we do science and the way universities are organized and probably also the way funding agencies think about funding science. So my question for all of you um, and particularly to you Richard is okay open science so what can journals do in thinking about changing the way they do business and their architecture to facilitate their piece of moving toward some of that revolution? And what uh, should we be doing in thinking about the architecture of universities and of funding agencies to catalyze the movement toward that revolution? Thank you. In the rear, and then yeah, we'll come uh, up to come back Quentin to Quentin Eichbaum, Vanderbilt University. Um, I would like the panel to readdress the question of competencies coming from the South. I don't think that was really re addressed, um, so if you could do that. But my question is um, concerning sort of bi-directional uh, uh, exchanges. I'm not sure we're doing enough about that, and what can we do to do more about that? Thank but in particular, the notion of um, 
reverse innovation, um, how would we address that more adequately? Great, thank you. Rick? Yeah, hi, thank you. Rick Burzon with the NIH. I have two uh, questions. One is a methods question, uh, uh, and King, perhaps you could answer this. Uh, when you Rick, do a survey one of- question, please. One question, when you do a survey of, of, 100, of around 100 and you get a 25% response rate, um, how, uh, um, how sure are you of the results that you're getting? And did you uh, interview the people that didn't respond, try to track them down to try to find out exactly what their issues are? Uh, because maybe they're different than what you found in the report. Um, the other point I just want to make about uh, the fact that we in the United States have a model of capitalism. Whether it's good or bad, that's, that's what we have. Um, I'm guessing that all of the universities and colleges have strategic plans, uh, which go out probably five, seven, ten years. Um, it's probably very difficult for them to turn around and make a change in the way they do business, because they have to do business to bring in students and so forth and so on. That might be something that the board may want to think about or that you may want to address in the report, because it, it, you know, it's just obvious that schools and universities uh, are going to follow the trend and they're going to market their programs and so forth and so on, and that's going to play into how successful these programs are. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to turn to our uh, speakers here to wrap up, uh, and I want uh, King to be the last word here um, uh, on that. And so maybe we could start in Nelson, uh, Vanessa and Richard, and then uh, King, you can uh, clean up the, <laughs> the, the play bat cleanup here. Nelson? Yeah, regarding the architecture of universities and uh, funders, certainly those need to change. And I think one, uh, one of the ways to do that is constant advocacy and talking about these issues. Uh, and in any case, at the end of the day, the architecture of universities is, is made by the people in this room, types of people in this room. And so we just need to do more work in that direction. Regarding the funders, we know that when we keep talking to the funders, they begin to change a few things. And I've put examples of where funders have shown some change. And so we, again, we just need to constantly uh, keep bombarding at them. Uh, the bi-directional uh, bi exchanges of students or faculty, that's part of my uh, plea for equitable partnerships. Um, and the question of co uh, uh, competences, I mean, we all know that that's a long issue, and it takes time to sort out which competences would be agreeable upon by different uh, players. So that is work on progress, in progress, and we know that some people are working on those uh, competences. Um, for the sake of time, I'll just focus on a few quick things. I think that the ways that we, just on the competence issues, I mean, I would challenge this is an opportunity for CGH if it's truly a consortium of universities globally from around the world to actually create sort of what are standards, like a, a bill of rights of partnerships, if you will, to say, we believe that there should be, you know, if you're gonna send your students to go, then you're, you should receive students, and that should be a requirement. Just a note on that, it's incredibly difficult. We're trying to find a way for our MEDs registrars to come participate in clinical care in Massachusetts, but the laws are very restrictive, and so we're actually trying to change the law or find loopholes, get the, Harvard University to be able to accept them under a special student status so that they can get covered. But creating dynamic changes like that benefits everybody, including our own students and trainees here. So I would challenge to think creatively about things like that. Um, and, I, and I think that, that, so that can be incredibly important in terms of the, the bi-directional exchanges. But we should challenge ourselves to say what makes a good partnership and who are the models out there that we want to take from. Um, for the question for mentoring, you know, I think it's an incredibly important one as somebody who has an incredibly generous and extraordinary, uh, you know, mentors. And I know that a lot of the mentorship I've received has been done uh, through just pure generosity. And I think that, you know, to speak again, I'm very lucky to have, you know, my mentor in the room here, but he has been very creative to find ways to help me support my career because I don't follow under the typical NIHK or some of the other you know mechanisms that are much more structured and I think it has to be a commitment to building leadership and you know the examples of the leadership that were you know King Holmes has mentored are extraordinary and and I think that 
we have to sort of decide what our global contribution is going to be and what we value. And again, I think that has to be a collective conversation and set of standards that we decide upon and say, this is what we are going to value and put forth. And then you have to advocate. The final thing I would just offer is that if you really want to see programs and strategic plans change, it takes effort. It takes face-to-face -face meeting. It takes discussion. And it takes really getting involved, not just sort of issuing a piece of paper or meeting once a year. It, it really it takes time and effort. And we need to commit ourselves to really uh, putting that effort in um, to be able to see the changes we want. Rich. OK, let me pick up Judy's um, question. Uh, very directly, what can journals do? Some years ago, um, I wrote that journals and publishers are institutionally racist. And by that, I don't mean that individual editors or individuals in publishing organizations are racist, but the conditions in which we operate lead us to behave in ways that create biases and prejudices which ultimately are exclusionary and therefore often racist. Um, and that remains true today as it was a few years ago when I wrote that piece. So what can we do? We can actually do a lot. A lot of journals like to call themselves international. They're not international at all. They're deeply parochial. They're only writing about themselves and their narrow areas they work. And they're certainly not writing about the large parts of the world. So address equitably the, uh, those all, all of the world um, as much as you can in your discipline and truly try to address societal challenges. Second, don't just publish science for for other scientists, but think about how you publish uh, the research that you do publish and, and how you write so that it's drawing attention to policy makers and decision makers. That's what we say to people who are writing series and commissions for The Lancet. The people you are trying to get to are decision makers, policy makers, the public, not just other typical readers of The Lancet who I care about desperately, but not so much that we only want to focus on them. And lastly, please, please, please remember that the challenges that we face at journals um, are not technical challenges, they're not scientific challenges, they're political challenges. Don't be afraid to put politics at the heart of what you do at journals, at CUGH, in global health. Thank you. King? Well, two issues on the, on the topic of mentorship and authorship. Um, it's more than uh, who is listed uh, first, second, or third, or, or wherever on the, on the manuscript. I think it's particularly important in working in other countries uh, to uh, uh, recognize the people who are doing the collaboration. But I think the, what it really, people have to appreciate is that what is most important is to start right at the very beginning and defining what is the background of why you're undertaking the research with your collaborator or your mentee. What are the specific aims? Uh, uh, what are the goals of the study? Uh, how do you interpret them? Because those are the people who are ultimately going to be you know, left behind in implementing the results of the study. And so I think it's very important to think not just about who goes first, second, or third uh, on the authorship list, but uh, uh, how do you really bring them along with you on the ride so that when you're finished with the study, the study is going to have some impact. Uh, so that's a point. Uh, in terms of the uh, points you raised, Rick, uh, there is a, a page on here I'd call everybody's attention to on the report, page 17, that was uh, briefly constructed, but I think addresses uh, some of the issues. And I think the, I view these results as preliminary, and I think the information that we got out of it is a guide to what could be a, a very interesting, uh, uh, more detailed uh, uh, study informed both by this discussion and by what we learned from the survey. Um, I think that uh, we did have a wide range of institution types and sizes and locations, but they did tend to be state-run or larger private universities, and some that may have been more motivated or able to respond, and they may not be representative of what is going on at all the universities. So I think it will be important to go on. I do think that uh, people who are working in the field globally uh, like those in the CDC, for example, or some of the USAID field, people really understand uh, the importance both of the engagement of the uh, collaborators in the research projects per se um, and uh, in uh, uh, these kinds of surveys. So thank you. Thank you. We're, we're at the end of our time here. Um, I want to remind you all 
a videotape version of this, and the link, the web link version to the report will be on CSIS website and smartglobalhealth.org, and will be probably posted in some other sites, and we will be distributing this report around. I want to thank Catherine Streifel and Jesse Swanson from our staff for their work on this. I want to particularly thank King, Alistair, Judd, and James, the authors of the study, for doing the study and putting it out on such a rushed basis. And I want to thank all of our panelists, uh, Richard Nelson, Vanessa, and King, for such a rich, quite extraordinary discussion we've been able to have.